Okay, so the question is, is a voucher program a free market type of proposal? So to brief, briefly review the key elements of a free market, a free market is about respecting the individual's rights to his own life and property, his ability to use his earnings as he sees fit. And then the number two great pillar of the free market is the ability of people to interact with others on a voluntary basis. Okay, so the question is, does, what, how does a voucher program fit into that? Well, a voucher program is forcing some people, including all of us who pay taxes related to education, to pay into the government, which then in turn gives the money to parents, which then in turn gives the money to schools. So a voucher is not a free market sort of solution. You can say many other things about a voucher program, or tax credits also go, go into this range, but saying that they're a free market is not one of those things. Okay? So this is just a basic, a basic starting point on what a voucher is. A voucher is more properly considered a, a forced wealth transfer, a, part, a sort of welfare or an entitlement. That's what a voucher is properly characterized as. So here's the next main point I want to go through. What is the relationship between vouchers and church and state? So we know that there is the First Amendment, the great declaration of religious and speech freedom in our country, and there's what's called the Establishment Clause. So the Supreme Court, Court has ruled that in fact vouchers pass muster with the First Amendment. And so that's the, that's the given legal interpretation of the day. And yet I want to go back up a step past beyond the legal ruling and look at the morality and justice of forcing some individuals to pay some of their money to religious institutions that they may not support. Is that basically just and moral? And I'm going to say that if we take the concept of individual rights seriously, then we have to at least think seriously about the idea that, no, that doesn't really pass moral muster. So what's the underlying principle behind the First Amendment that unifies the different elements of the First Amendment? We could summarize that as freedom of conscience. You have the right to believe what you want to believe, advocate the views you want to advocate, and then act according to those beliefs. Right? So that encompasses freedom of speech, freedom of religion, all the different aspects of the First Amendment. So again, is it just, is it the right thing to do to force some people to subsidize religious institutions against their will, even if we use parents as a conduit? So the answer is no, if we take freedom of conscience really seriously, or at least we have to really think carefully about that as a problem. So whether we look at it from a property rights perspective, people have the right to use their own income as they see fit, or from a speech aspect, in other words, people have the right of free speech. The right of free speech entails the right not to speak and not to support ideas that you may disagree with. Whether we look at it from either of those angles, it's really morally questionable, I think immoral, to force people to subsidize religious institutions against their will. Now, of course, I would add here, being a free market advocate, that it is also unjust to force people to subsidize secular ideologies with which they may disagree. For example, in Denver, there is a green, quote, charter school. And the purpose of this school, largely, as far as I can tell, is to indoctrinate children into the pseudo-religion of environmentalism. So somehow, this is approved under the charter school system, but religious schools, no, 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 no. But according to freedom of conscience, that's really a similar sort of condition. So again, legal, but I'm saying there's a justice issue with vouchers going to fund ideologies which people may find disagreeable. But vouchers don't merely have to pass constitutional muster at the federal level. They also have to pass constitutional muster at the state level. And the, relative, the relevant state measure in Colorado is from Article 9, Section 7, of the state constitution. And I'm going to read it to you because I think it's relevant. Neither the General Assembly nor any county, city, town, township, school district, or other public corporation shall ever make any appropriation or pay from any public fund or monies whatever, anything, in aid of any church or sectarian society, or for any sectarian purpose, or to help, support, or sustain any school, academy, seminary, college, university, or other literary or scientific institution controlled by any church or sectarian denomination whatsoever. Now friends, I cannot imagine constitutional language being written in a more crystal clear way than that. If that's not clear, nothing in any constitution is clear. 
And so it worries me that when our side is the side that says, we support applying the written constitution as it's written, not just asking judges to override the constitution according to some other, you know, however we want to interpret it. That causes concern to me as an issue, as a constitutional issue. So I've heard the case that this measure has bigoted origins. I have not personally looked at the history carefully enough to make a, a, a full decision or final decision. However, I would note that Ed Quillen wrote something up for the Denver Post with a contrary view. So there's different ideas floating out around up here. But from a legal perspective, that's irrelevant. It doesn't matter what the motives were for a constitutional provision. If our side says, we agree to abide by the Constitution, then what you have to do is go by that even if you disagree with it. And if you disagree with it, there's a way to change that, which is to amend the Constitution. We have a mechanism for that here in the state. So I am going to go now into the alternatives that I find more interesting than vouchers. I do support more flexibility in the current system. I have been to charter schools in the state. For example, I've been to Ridgeview Classical School up in Fort Collins, where I interacted with the students. And I, was, I, I, was, I found it phenomenal, the level of teaching, the level of student excitement and enthusiasm for their, for their education. I was really impressed by this. And for, for once, I had hope for the future of our civilization when we have education of this caliber. So it is possible, even within a given system. I've also been, I thought Devlin over in Golden was a charter school, but no, they're actually called an option school. I can't explain the difference between an option school and a charter school. But in Colorado, there's many different possibilities of coming up with alternative schooling within basically the government system. And I would point out that one of the problems in, in Mr. Bowden's movie is that it was simply too difficult to get new charter schools approved, right? Well, one solution to that is perhaps vouchers. Another is simply to say, look, we should open up charter schools to to fair review and open up the ones that we think are appropriate. Another interesting idea is a universal tax credit. So in other words, whatever money you put in in taxes for education, you get to direct where that money goes. To the, it can be the Denver Green School or Ridgeview Classical School, whichever one I want. Right? This, would be, this would grant an enormous amount of choice, not merely to the parent, but to the person footing the bill, the taxpayer. Right? When we talk about school choice, please let's not leave out the choice of the people footing the bill here. And so I find that very interesting, and at least that would seem to bypass the freedom of conscience issue. Because if I wanted my money to go to a religious school, then I can do that. If I don't, I can give it to the green charter school or whatever <coughs> school I want. Right? So at least that mitigates, at least to a degree, the freedom of conscience problem with vouchers. Obviously, we should hold the line on government controls, including government spending of education. We don't want the government to become even more powerful. We don't want the teachers unions to get even more money to pay off their politicians to set education policy. We certainly want to protect the homeschooling, the, the large homeschooling community, and the market schools. And this is interesting, right? As we saw in this movie, vouchers are regulated by the state, by the government, by politicians, right? That's what their proponents tell us happens, and it must happen. You're not just going to get vouchers to go to the school for visiting Disney World, right? That's going to last about a day, and then they're going to pass regulations and controls, right? So if we're going to have these controls anyway, I, I'm, I'm, why don't we just go through a more expansive choices within the given system? Another interesting idea, introduce means testing into the financing of government schools. So in other words, if you have money to pay for your children's education, maybe you ought to be doing that. And maybe we ought to spread as a cultural idea this idea that parents indeed have the basic responsibility for educating their children. Let's start with the more well off, and then we can cut the tax burden on everyone else proportionally. I think that would be a really interesting line to pursue. So what ultimately is my goal? My ultimate goal is to convert education per se, all schools, to a free and voluntary market, which means that the educators, the parents, and voluntary groups come together and decide the curriculum, decide how education is run, and crucially, work out the financing for that education. That is the only thing compatible with true education choice, meaning that you, the taxpayer, have the choice of whether you even want to finance education at all or do something else entirely with your money. Maybe you'd rather go to cancer research or your own business or your own college education. That, my friends, is freedom of choice when you, the person earning the money, get to decide how that money is spent. In a free market, we could open up 
the innovation that we've seen in other fields, such as the computer industry. We could see this commitment to excellence that we see in other, in, in, in other fields if we have a free market of edu in, in education. And so ultimately, this is what I would like to promote. So I know it's a different sort of set of ideas, but ultimately I think we'll only be successful if we have clearly defined principles, a clear vision of what we're actually trying to achieve, and if we, even though it might seem impossibly difficult now, useful, the best social movements, that's oft always the case. At first it seems like it's an impossible goal, but it's always impossible until you stand up and say, this is possible. And I am saying that a free market education is possible over enough years with if enough people work relentlessly toward that. And that is my basic position. Thank you. Here, the take home point I got from this film is that the problem arises when you have a fundamental disconnect between the people paying the bills and the people receiving the money. That's the fundamental problem. Because of the forced wealth transfer, right? We're taking the money from you by force. You have no choice. If you choose not to do it, you go to jail ultimately, or we, direct, or we forcibly take it from you one way or another. Right? There's a disconnect. So you have a disincentive to monitor how that money is being spent, because you're no longer the one responsible for the spending of it. So will vouchers fundamentally solve that problem? Well, what it will do, one thing that was interesting in this film is that vouchers are compared to food stamps. How's that program working out for us? <laughs> what you're doing is you're creating an incentive for parents, a new voting block, devoted to increasing the amount that you can get in a voucher. Because you want your kid to go to the school, not just with good, ed with good teachers, but with the Olympic-sized swimming pool, and the world-class track team, right? And the uh, film studio, so they can make their own documentaries of this caliber, right? This is your incentive now as a parent, because you still have a fundamental disconnect between the people paying the bills and the people receiving the money. And so this is, I guess, the fundamental reason why I am nervous about vouchers. But I do think it's worth a clarification here, right? School choice does not equal government-funded vouchers. School choice is very broad, and there's very, very much that we all three agree on. Having been to charters, I am a big fan of charter schools. Um, having, I like the fact that Colorado students can choose among traditional government-run schools. Um, I like the fact that I like things that work outside the government. There's a guy here in town, Steve Shuck, who devotes enormous funds to private vouchers. I have zero problem with those. I think those are a great idea. And so, uh, yeah, all this kind of voluntary charity, schools offering breaks to poorer kids, this is all part of, a, in my view, a free market. There is a, an important difference, though, between, well, I want to clarify the difference between a voucher and a uh, tax credit. A tax credit is still forcing you to spend X amount of your money on education through various taxes. So you still have, but you at least get to choose, you know, does it go to school A or school B? You can give all your money to, you know, whatever school. Um, so that's the difference, but it's still not your choice of what are you going to do with your money, right? It's like saying, you know, you have to buy a car over $30,000 this year, but we'll let you choose the BMW or the Mercedes, okay? That's the kind of choice we're talking about. Um, so I just wanted to clarify those, those big concepts. But my point was this, right? When we talk about school choice, it's a big mistake if we are only referring to the choice of the parents. Because where are they getting the money? They're getting the money from politicians literally holding a gun to a taxpayer's head and saying, you will pay this money for this voucher program. So what I'm saying is, when we're, if we're going to talk about school choice, let's not leave out the choice of the person who is actually paying the bill. And ultimately, if you want real choice, you have to respect the individual's right to direct his own income as he sees fit. If you don't want to give one red cent to education, that is your right. If we take property rights and individual rights seriously.